Hi everyone, Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical precious metals brokerage house specializing in gold and silver, but really in creating strategies. Today on Insider Trading, we're going to take a look at what the insiders did this past week. But I want you to be aware of a very important pattern shift because the wick has been lit and it's the 10 year interest rates. The fuse that we've all been watching is Deutsche Bank. And so today we're going to take a look at their 2017 annual report. But keep in mind, they have a huge derivative bond. So first we're going to go ahead, bomb, I meant, sorry about that. <laughs> but first we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at what the insiders did this week. There was some very, very heavy selling. Industrials topped the list this week with for every $1 worth of buying, they did over $30,000 worth of selling. That's pretty significant. You also have transportation. At 385, technology, consumer services, media. But what you also have is that there are a couple of entities, sorry about this, I'm still getting used to working with this, that did not buy at all. And that would be business services and energy. And we know energy has been moving up. So that's what the insiders have been up to at this juncture. It seems like we always have one that's you know, did almost very little selling, or rather very little buying and a tremendous amount of selling. And really, that's what the uh, business services and the energy is. It's lots of selling and no buying. But here's a real key, because this is the wick, and it's the 10-year treasury interest rates. Because you have to keep in mind that this is the bedrock of the global financial system. And we know there's a lot of things that are going on in the interest rate and in the debt markets. So you could see this long-term downward trend line in interest rates, and you can see that there is a probable shift here because the next part goes below zero, which we very well may see anyway. But let me show this to you on a shorter term so you can actually see what they're talking about on TV and what the shift possibly is. What we're looking at here is the trend line which was broken right here. See that trend line when the, share, when the uh, interest rates went above 250 the beginning of January? That was a possible trend shift and we talked about it at that time from a trend that actually started back in mid-2016. But you always have to wait and see if this is going to be pervasive. In this case, it certainly was. Once it broke that trend line, it moved up pretty rapidly. Well, guess what? A very same thing has happened now. It's just broken above a resistance level. So now we have to see if this is going to be pervasive. If it is then we should see it go to 350 pretty quickly. This, you have to understand the thing about the bonds is it regulates the entire debt market, which is way larger than the stock market. But what's been happening with the stock market? You know, did they know this was gonna happen? Is that why they had to engineer these great price earnings in an attempt to overcome what was happening in the interest rate markets? Because that's really pretty much what it's looking like to me. Now you can see the 10 year yield, all of the yields are up. That's what it being green there means. But you can see that the key here is the 10 year yield that has gone above that 3% level. Historically, 3% is low, but it's significant because it very well appears to be signaling a shift in the trend. Now, if the markets continue to be choppy with interest rates at 3%, well, what do we know? We know that in this country, in the U.S., the Federal Reserve is committed to raising the overnight rates to 3.25%. So if a 10-year yield 
over 3% is problematic for the markets. What exactly do you think this might do? And could this be the mechanism that they're using to shift us? Because remember, and we're going to be talking about this a little bit more, but the IBORs, the interbank uh, lending rate, overnight rate, is going away in 2021. So this whole debt mechanism has to reshape itself and create new products for itself. Now, that is the wick. And that wick has been lit, and it really was lit in mid-16 when we hit that bottom. But this is the fuse, because as the IMF told us, Deutsche Bank is, is a globally, they're connected to every single bank and every on some level, every single financial product on the planet. So Deutsche Bank is a huge key, and we can certainly see what their stock has been doing, and it doesn't look very rosy. But they did come out with their annual report, so let's look at that. Okay, now we know that they've had losses now one, two, three years in a row. Now, how is it that they have such huge losses? This is uh, 750 million euros. But how is it having so many losses and they're still surviving? I mean, if you had this massive a loss, I think you would have gone bankrupt by now. And I'm going to give you my opinion on this in a second. But... What about the debt and leverage? Because that's how I believe they've been, and that and the central banks not wanting them to implode is how they've managed to continue to survive on some level. But they've also had debt raisings, or rather equity raisings, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So how do they do that? Well, first let's look at their debt. Now, this is is what is coming due. This is less than a year. This is one to three years. Now, here's the thing about that particular debt. All of that debt that's coming due, 52% of their overall debt, which is, this is also in the hundreds. So it's 200, almost 225, uh, let's see, this would be millions, billion euros. Okay, so that's quite a bit of debt. 52% of that comes due within the next three years. So that debt is either going to have to be paid, rolled over, or into the old LIBOR, against the old LIBOR interest rates, or it has to be rescheduled or reshuffled into the new system, which is just now coming online and there is no market for it yet. So I don't know which benchmark they're gonna use. Since 2008, they've continued to use the LIBOR or the IBORs. And so this debt that comes due with Deutsche Bank, we don't know how that's going to reset itself yet. That could be problematic in and of itself. But then you have 48% of its debt that comes due after that, which actually means that 48% of Deutsche Bank's debt contracts that they owe on have to be restructured into, again, the new system that they're trying to be put in place. Do you think that could go off without a hitch? Because it's separate valuations. And that's the other piece of this. Once that shift happens, even if somehow by some miracle they manage to do everything absolutely perfectly and get everybody to agree to it from this system whose rates are based on a certain amount and all of the products they create against that certain amount, value, that means each one of those contracts have a value based on that rate. So now they're going into a different rate structure calculated differently. So all of those contracts have to be amended and shifted into the new way that they're going to calculate this. The value of these contracts will be different than the value of these contracts. And that's going to impact Deutsche Bank and every other bank and every other 
a financial institution or anybody that works in these debt contracts and derivatives, that's going to impact it. So 48% of Deutsche Bank's debt comes after that. But let's look at their leverage. And I've talked a lot about the leverage ratio. So I'm going to go into that. There's been some questions on it. And let's take a look at this. Because I can tell you what I see and what I discover. I will tell you that we live in a fantasy world. So it is not always that even what we see and we discover and we know as a fact does not necessarily uh, become reflected. Okay, so let's look at the leverage. First of all, look at their derivative exposure that they admit to, and that would be $166 billion. But remember, they can, and they do, if, you, if you'll have the link to this, actually you have the link to this, so go in and read their financial report for yourself, and what you're going to see is they use all this netting and compression and all these fancy, uh, fancy accounting tricks to make things look a whole lot smaller than they are. So this means that that's hidden leverage. We have no idea of the real value that is at risk. But I can tell you that this document is 471 pages long and derivatives were mentioned in it 372 times. So you can see that derivatives are a, a huge part of Deutsche Bank. It's leverage, derivatives are leverage. Then you have the total securities financing transaction. And what that is, is hypothecation leverage. So what that means is that whoever, whatever deposits they have, whatever securities that they're holding, however they took those securities in, they are using the equity from their depositors to borrow on their behalf. And that's securities lending. Between the two of them, that is well over $300 billion. And again, because this hypothecation, I mean, if this is rehypothecation, in other words, somebody used equity to borrow from Deutsche Bank and left that equity with them, like Venezuela recently did with, unfortunately, a big chunk of their gold reserves. Okay, well, Venezuela defaulted and Deutsche Bank got to continue to hold and count as a uh, benefit to them those gold reserves, and certainly they were a benefit to Deutsche Bank. So on this side of the transaction, we've got well over $300 billion in notional value. That means nobody knows the true value that is at risk. And then, of course, you know, total off-balance issues, and then other assets that they are, you have to read the report, not going into, but that is offset, and I'm going to show you this a little more deeply, in the bail-in instruments that they're able to do. So they were in deep doo-doo last summer. They issued $80 billion worth of stock. H&A was a big buyer of that stock, and in fact, uh, H&A is a Chinese corporation that's one that's been on a global buying spree, and now they're starting to sell those shares of stock off, but they bought enough to be a 10% stakeholder in Deutsche Bank. They probably pretty much bought almost the whole issue. Well, good for Deutsche Bank because that gave them a lot of cash, plus the stocks are bail-inable, and I'm going to show you that in a minute too but so are deposits. So anybody that's got an account at Deutsche Bank, that money is also bail inable. But their leverage ratio fully loaded is 3.8. Now last year it was 3.5, so it's gotten a little bit better, but that still means that they have $26 in debt for every $1 in equity. So a 4% move down in the value of their assets means that, a, well, technically, they're insolvent. Their debt now exceeds their assets. So how come it didn't implode? Really good question. I think we'll answer that a little bit more. But that's what all of that means. $26 in debt to every dollar's worth of equity. So if this equity drops 
more than 3.8%, then they're insolvent. Doesn't necessarily apparently mean that they're going to go away, but absolutely can tell you that according to their data, that's what that means. You can do the math for yourself. Okay. So in all of this garbage, because so much is hidden, can you really tell how much leverage they're having? No. Or they're using? No, you really can't tell. You know, we're blind to that. But what I can tell you is last year in, in a central bank led synchronized up market, their overall assets declined by 7%. So in reality, according to their own data, well, maybe that's why they had to, well, that was actually why they had to raise that capital. So the decline was, it was driven by their derivative book, but it was offset by deposits and new issue of stock, going back to that 80 billion that they issued. So you can see that the, what they're doing is they're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul to try and hold this whole thing together when in reality it's really falling apart and they know it. So they have to address, like all banks these days do, their recovery and resolution plan, which is really the bail-in plan. What is at risk? And I'm going to show you the hierarchy. But what is at risk are stocks, well, actually any stocks that you're holding in there, bonds, deposits, money markets, okay? So here we go. Deutsche Bank, they say it right here, would be recapitalized through a direct bail-in. So if they are holding your wealth, they get to bail it in. Now, they recently changed legislation in the EU that enabled that. Okay, so, I mean, it isn't like you and I have a choice, just the government changes the laws to accommodate the bail-in. And they've done this. This is the global blueprint. So this is the order in which they would go ahead and bail in. Now, you just bought stock like whoever buys the stock from H&A, but whoever buys the stock, you just bought it, and that can be converted into new shares in the failing institution. And then there are special bonds that have been created that are loss absorbing. Those get bailed in. Then deposits, derivatives, other bonds, and money markets. That's the order of the bail-in. And remember, Deutsche Bank's derivative book is the largest in the world. And according to the IMF, they are the most dangerous bank because they are a global universal bank, which means, and you can see it in this IMF graphic, that they touch on some level. Here are all your major banks around the world. All those little gray areas are all the smaller banks and financial institutions. So Deutsche Bank, because of its scope and its derivative book and its leverage and its reach, they touch every, well, according to the IMF, pretty much every financial product in the world. So it doesn't matter whether you know it or not. When Deutsche Bank sneezes, everybody will catch a cold. And that is why I believe, and I just showed you, they're a zombie bank. They have $26 in debt for every $1 worth of equity. That's an awful lot of leverage. And we don't even know if that's true. That's just with all the accounting gimmicks, what they came up with. So we've got the LIBOR. We've got the interest rates breaking above 3%. We'll see if that becomes pervasive. But let's see how it impacted everything. The 3% above 10. Well, here you go you can see pretty clearly that the trend line in stocks, look at the difference. Can you see this pattern shift that we've been talking about? We started talking about, I started really noticing general pattern shifts over here. We've been talking about it since then. Yeah, I'm not going to ever know it the moment before. If I ever do, that is luck. That is all that is. But you can certainly see that this pattern looks different Look at the trend line in the 10-year treasury bond 
price. We've been talking about the yields, but you remember when yields go up, the price goes down. When yields go down, the price goes up. So, you know, if you had if you had treasuries, which are considered risk-free, I might add, I don't think any of this is risk-free, but there you go. You're down quite a bit since September, and then certainly going back further because this trend started to shift in mid-16. Here's the dollar, also considered a safe haven asset, and here's the manipulated spot gold. So I ask you, which one of these patterns looks different than the others? And where do you really want to hold your wealth? You really have to stop and think about it. Not in paper gold for sure. Okay, because all of this stuff is easy to manipulate. And I think that they're getting prepped. It's, it's, it really is all about the eyebores. Every single contract, not just Deutsche Banks, but every single contract, every the mortgages, the auto loans. You look in your documentation. If it says that they have to comply with something, that's how they do it. You have to find out what it's tied to, but it doesn't matter because every interest rate and every contract is going to have to shift. There is not going to be anything that is immune from this. This is the bedrock. The bonds are the bedrock of the global financial situ circumstance. This is how money is created in this system. And the interest rate that they've tied almost every contract to is going away in 2021. So um, yesterday or Tuesday, I did an interview. Have, has that been published yet, Megs? Okay, so if you stay tuned with Megan, it was on Gold Seek Radio, and it was really a lot of fun, and it was a really interesting, I, I thought this was a really interesting interview. So uh, for all the social media, media, Megan will let you know when that airs. And again, reminding you that May 19th, I'm going to be in Poughkeepsie, New York. So if you want to come see me live and sit down, have conversation, bring all your questions, that should be a really fun day. And I'm getting excited about it. I will definitely be talking about a lot of these significant things um, in detail. But it'll be a give and a take. Don't forget, I'll be live Coffee with Lynette, Gerald Salente on, isn't that the 20th? Or the 21st? On the 21st, live with Gerald Salente because he lives in Kingston, my hometown. So, you know, if you can join us, that would be fantastic. And is there anything else? SGT on Tuesday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean at SGT. That should promise to be a very interesting conversation this time. So I'm really looking forward to it because when Sean gets excited about a topic, and I know he's going to get excited about the one that I'm bringing there on Tuesday with him, uh, then it's always a very fun exchange. We kind of feed off of each other's energy, and it's really a lot of fun. So between, well, I'm going to work on getting part four done. No, no, we're at part three tomorrow. I'm sorry, it's kind of a blur. I just keep going from one to the other. So it's kind of a little bit of a blur for me. But part three on what happens to income producing assets and the opportunities that present during hyperinflation. And it's coming. People, it's coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got a drop dead deadline. Get ready. Get in place. Make sure that you share. If you like this, give us a thumbs up. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so we'll let you know when we're doing them live. And um, I'm hoping to see you tomorrow. So take care out there. You be safe. Bye-bye.